Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for joining me. And this is about the show. And I've had to do this several times over the last decade. This show is almost 12 years old, uh, with episodes going back to the beginning of my radio career back in 2008, which patrons can hear for a handsome fee if you join our Patreon. But uh, it is customary for a podcast in their first episode to be the about episode. So new listeners who are just finding the feed for the first time can get caught up and figure out what that show's about. And I wanted to do that because I think it's time to refresh a little bit, uh, even our current audience, about where we're at as a show, where we're going, and what we're doing here on The Chris Spangle Show. Um, I have been podcasting since 2007. Um I started at a news talk radio station. Just a little bit about my career. I'll be very brief about all this. I started at uh, News Talk 1430 uh, with my first mentor, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, learning the ropes of talk radio. And it was really there that I saw that the Republicans, uh, I was the college Republican chair in 2004 during Bush's reelection, huge Republican, thought Democrats were all evil, you know, all that typical stuff that a college Republican thinks. And then I got involved in politics as a sort of reporter <laughs> at the News Talk radio station. Radio news people are not as aggressive or rigorous as journalists, but um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I got to go to all these different events, and I saw that the Republicans were just as dirty and as corrupt as the Democrats. And so I started to think that we needed a third party. I'd been a big Ross Perot fan back in the day. And I reached out to the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and I said, hey, why aren't you guys functional? And they said, because we don't have an executive director. Now, I, at the time making $17,000 a year in 2008, was looking for a career change. And so for the low, low price of $22,000 a year, I was uh, off to become the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana for four years, which was just a tremendously great experience, helping people set up hundreds of campaigns, kept my podcasting career going there. I started We Are Libertarians as a college outreach podcast there with a couple of guys, Creighton Harrington and Chris Galt. And uh, it became really like a weekly round table of friends hanging out and talking about politics. And that was the vibe for the podcast for a long time. And that is still going to be the vibe of the show. That will always be the core of the Chris Spangle Show and the We Are Libertarians podcast network. It is friends talking about current events, culture, politics, history, our families, our friendships, whatever that comes along uh, through conversation. Uh, but, you know, my personal life, I, I was married in 2000 and something, 2011. Uh, it, it, it did not work out well, the first marriage. And I actually got divorced in the middle of an episode of We Are Libertarians in February of 2014. If you go back to the archives later in that month, you'll hear me, Gina, and uh, our co-host, co Greg, uh, talking. And I go silent halfway through the episode. That's because my wife was packing up. And I went through a very difficult personal experience over the next three to four years, kind of uh, my midlife crisis in my early 30s. <laughs> um, you know, the, the We Are Libertarians, I, I was raised on Howard Stern in South Park and in a very secu uh, culturally secular, non-Christian environment. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and it happened at the same time that I got dumped by my high school sweetheart. And had like a very difficult period at the end of 2001 as a result and ended up becoming a Christian then and became an on-fire convert, learning about Christianity for the first time for the fir for those first five years. And then I got baptized and then it just like the lights went out. And I spent a long time not really engaging in my faith, claiming that I was a Christian, but really through my period of divorce, especially not living that way. And that was reflected in all the content, and uh, the show was a lot of fun, but it was also not the healthiest thing for all of us, you know. And then when, when I decided to start taking my faith and my mental health and my physical health more seriously in 2017, that caused a lot of issues with a lot of people and led to some, uh, some changes within all of the different podcasts. And, uh, you know, 
I am a big advocate for mental health. It really changed my life. And I went to therapy for four years, twice a week for two years is how messed up I was. And it really helped me get my bearings and get uh, some courage and really find my center. And, you know, that led to me being healthy enough to meet my current wife, who is the love of my life, Reagan. We met in 2019 and uh, she brought a little girl to the marriage. And now we have a son. We've been married for almost two years as I record this in September of 2023. And uh, we got married in 2021, and, and that has just been a huge blessing. But it's also hard when the core of your show is having your buddies come over to your bachelor pad every Thursday night at 7 and leaving at 11 p.m. And uh, it's hard to convince your wife to let them do that when you get married. So for the last couple of years, um, we've been doing a lot of interviews. And I will be frank, a lot of it has been to keep this, sh this feed functioning while I learn about what I want to say. Because something happened to me intellectually in 2019. Not only did I meet Reagan, um, not only did I know that while I was a libertarian, I had not finished college. I was not intellectually and philosophically as grounded as I needed to be. Uh, while I was informed and smart, I didn't necessarily have the classical educational training that a lot of other folks had. And I, I saw the gaps in the researching of my show as I started to do that. And I felt... Like, I needed to really engage in reading a lot and go back to school. And I went back to school for a couple semesters. I will finish my degree at some point. It's financially very difficult for us right now and time-wise. Um, but I started podcast consulting in 2019, and my first client was this guy named Robert Vane, who's become a great and dear friend and business partner of mine, and we do the Leaders and Legends podcast, and it basically is Robert interviewing the elites of Indiana, people who are incredibly successful in sports, politics, government, nonprofits, business, you name it. And the thing that I saw consistently through those episodes was that they're massive readers. Every single one of those people who were achieving high levels of success in their field read a lot of books. And I realized I wasn't reading any books. I was reading maybe a book a year, if that. And I really recommitted myself to, to reading and trying to figure out what I believe. Uh, I also at the same time started the Pat Down podcast, which I continue to do, which was... Um, you know, Miss Pat is from inner city Atlanta, moved to Plainfield, Indiana. She did not grow up around white people. I did not grow up around black people. And, uh, you know, the thing about me is I love comfort. I love to be snugly and warm and not have to feel any level of discomfort. My baby boy who is three months old is exactly like me. The second he feels half a second of discomfort, he starts screaming and crying and wailing like it's the worst thing. He gets it from me. There is no doubt. Um, and so doing the podcast through 2019, especially through 2020, talking a lot about these cultural differences between Miss Pat and how she grew up and black culture and white culture and the way that I grew up and where she lived in Plainfield and then obviously George Floyd. That was an eye-opening experience uh, for me. And Miss Pat also has a huge backbone and is super accomplished and has really pushed me to be more courageous in communicating my ideas because I didn't want to offend anybody. And she's like, I want you to offend me. Don't be afraid. So... Those two experiences were really, really good for me, along with starting the business of doing the podcasting, consulting, putting myself out there, networking. I hate going to a networking event. It is absolutely abysmal trying to sit and, uh, I mean, it's just, so what you have to know about me is all goes back to like third grade. I'm out on the soccer field at recess and I ask the most popular kids if I can play soccer and they say no. And I just sit down and cry. <laughs> as a little third grader. And I think that feeling of like not feeling a part of the in crowd, not feeling accepted, not really feeling a part of a community um, had a big impact on me and my psychology. Uh, and then, you know, a few short years later, my parents getting divorced and my grandparents and great grandparents dying and having my nuclear and extended family kind of fall apart. 
And uh, then when I became a Christian, being a part of a youth group, like uh, the, the, those feelings of alienation and those feelings of community and feeling a part of your family, but feeling alienated of your family, feeling a part of your friends and not feeling... I don't think those are like strange, weird, new feelings. I don't think I'm special or anything. I think everybody's got that. Um, but it manifested itself for me in in a couple ways. Um, first, uh, at the time, I, I you know, kind of going through elementary and middle school, not really feeling very connected to any friend group. I was a huge fan of the Bob and Tom show. And that was the one thing my dad and I really could connect on other than the Indy 500, which I still love. And uh, I just got super into comedy and radio and the Bob and Tom show especially. And I think that sort of imprinted on me like this love of the power of audio to create these connections with people. And, you know, with We Are Libertarians, we've had... 50 to 100 co-hosts we've had 25 different shows like four or five marriages have come out of the friend group that came out of this my closest friend group are all people that you hear on the chris bangle show and the we are libertarians podcast network shows um you know it's it's a huge part of my life the community that we've built here likewise the pat down community and the Bob and Tom community, my day job is working for Bob and Tom. Yes, I got to do my dream job that I had been dreaming about since I was eight years old. I got to actually go work for Bob and Tom, which is where I developed a lot of the skills that I use for all this. Um, but it's that love of community that I think has really informed me uh, and really why I do a lot of what I do. I want to take an idea like libertarianism and gather people around it and f have them feel a part of it. I want you to help you start a podcast, the podcasting of platforms, and feel a part of it. The Pat Down, feel a part of this community. I'm working on an Indiana history podcast. I'm working on a couple other things, and all of them are community-related. That is a huge part of what I want you to get out of this show. I want you to connect uh, with other people that listen to this show via the chat at chrisbangle.com or the Walnuts Facebook group that you can find in the show notes and make some friends and be a part of the community because I think that's really important. I have learned doing Bob and Tom, We Are Libertarians, The Pat Down, all these different shows working with large audiences is people feel really lonely. A lot of people feel really disconnected. A lot of people feel... Uh, completely lost. And I think it, it's it's why I've rewritten the description of this show to, to, to speak to that need and try to, to build a podcast that really helps engage you. I, I am a Christian. I am a libertarian. Um, I do want to talk about history. I do want to talk about things that you may sometimes not be all that interested in. But I, I do want this to be the full expression of my interest and the full expression of my personality. And I felt um, after 2020, 2021, that doing the We Are Libertarians podcast was too constricting because I wanted to do a show that was the full expression of my interest and ideas and the full range of my life and um, expressing that to you in a way that you get value out of it. Not just so we're talking about me and my life and you're hearing from my wife or kids or family or friends or you know people that I like, but that in those conversations, you find things that you can take and use in your life that give value back to you. And so the new description of the show, I, I think reflects kind of where my head's at at this point in time. Um, which is that I feel politically homeless. I feel spiritually thirsty. I feel financially and relationally fragile. Uh, I, I think life currently as it's set up has left a lot of us feeling completely alienated from each other, wanting some belonging. And I'm trying to talk through these things to figure out exactly what I believe um, in front of you. And I'm going to, continue to and will do more of interviewing people like writers who write books and historians and educators, people who are starting interesting businesses that are solving social problems and using free markets 
to solve those problems instead of government programs. I want to have more conversations with my wife about our family and the struggles that we're kind of thinking through and how we're raising young kids and how we're going to educate them. That's going to be something that I, I'm going to talk more about um, and, and express it in a more personal way because I'm talking to these people uh, over the last year or two as I'm asking these questions, but I'm not being really open with and honest with you about these are the questions that I'm asking. I'm just sort of letting the expert talk and asking them questions. And I don't think it's as interesting if you don't know why I'm asking these questions or talking to these people. So, um, you know, and really what am I, what am I trying to get at? I want the, like I said, the core of the show is not going to change. I, I have three different audiences that I've, I've basically got to satisfy with a podcast that is over 12 years old. There's the people that like the personal aspects of it. They like to hear the window into the lives of, me, the co-hosts, and the people that are connected to it. There's also the people that like the panel shows of friends sitting around the table talking, and there's people that like the interviews um, that that are a little more like current event and politically focused. So there's several different kind of veins that that I have to satisfy, and I'm I'm not going to do things terribly different. I'm going to actually do a little more um, without killing myself. Within measure, I may not be totally consistent with these things, but you know we're going to do more direct current event shows with the panels. Uh, we're going to try to be in person as often as possible, guaranteed once a month, over at the Doolittle Studios, um, where we all get together and actually have a conversation. Me and my friends have a conversation in person. Um, but I'd like to pick one night a week and just do the news of the week like we used to do. Uh, and I'm going to continue to doing interviews. And I also want to mix in conversations with my wife because my wife is really smart. And, you know, we went to the gospel coalition this past weekend and it was like a great needed thing for her and I to reconnect. And we had so many great conversations about culture and society and the way we're raising our kids and the problems that we may face and theology and all these different things. So she's very interesting. She's a, a teacher and, great mom. And, and, uh, so I'd like to mix in some of that and mix in more conversations with some of my friends and be a little more open on some of these podcasts than maybe I have been. I, I will say that, um, I used to be very open as a broadcaster and I would tell you anything on this podcast feed to my detriment. And then when Greg left the show, that was a very difficult personal break, uh, that I have not really ever talked about. And I'm not going to go into detail because I respect him and his, you know, and, and what happened there. Um, not everything that was on the show at the time was the case, but it was uh, something that kind of made me pull back and kind of go a little more guarded. And I never really got out of that and <laughs> never really found my footing to kind of being more open. And I'm, I'm going to do some more of that. Um, you know, so what are the big questions that I'm really wrestling with right now that I want, in addition to kind of like giving you my perspective on the news, the perspective from the other co-hosts on the news, uh, you know, from left to right, but mostly libertarian, mostly centrist, center right. Um, you know, my Christian perspective, but there will be other perspectives that are not Christian, that are not part of my camp uh, that you'll hear on this show, because part of it is wrestling with each other as friends have different opinions and trying to model to you how we talk about current events. But the questions that I'm really that I used to ask on this show was how can I make society more libertarian? Really, how can I get you to join the Libertarian Party? And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't care about that at all. I you know, after after COVID, it, it was such a deeply impactful shaping thing for me to see how so many libertarians went one way or the other <laughs> um, and feeling kind of lost in the middle of all of that and not really feeling a part of something uh, for the first time in a long time. It was just sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, you know, I don't know what to say about vaccines, for instance. I know what to say when it's government mandated vaccines. I'm not for that in any way, shape or form. Um, but like, I'm not going to, I, I like B 
being anti-government is easy. Uh, just don't do that, <laughs> right? But when when the news is so much more cultural, what perspective will you come at it with, right? And how can you talk in a way that really gets people to see your point of view without turning them off? Um, and so because I didn't have the language and the foundation to have a lot of the conversations of the last couple, couple years, I've kind of opted out a little bit of that. And I want to wade into some of those things, regardless of, you know, what you think or feel about my opinion, I want you to at least think. And, um, you know, the, the big central question of the show is no longer how can I make you more libertarian? I'm not trying to indoctrinate you like, like that. I, I'm The central questions now are, for me, is America exceptional? Like, are our founding principles as a country worth keeping? Because I think we're at a pivotal moment in the history of the country where we can go one way or the other. We can choose the unknown as a country and maybe move to a more uh, left-wing or right-wing ideology and form of government, or we can kind of re-explore those principles of the founding and pick the good parts like justice and liberty for all and um, reject some of those other pieces of it, like white supremacy, for instance. Um, what is worth keeping from the founding? That, I think, is the central political question for me. I think culturally, is Christianity a moral force for good? I think when I was a Christian and I converted 20 years ago, um, it was just accepted that being a Christian was good. You were a good person culturally, right? And it was starting to change, but... You know, apologetics, which is the study of convincing you how, you know, like big questions like, does God exist? Why are there two stories in this book? And, you know, did Jesus actually raise from the grave? That's like a po classic apologetics, right? But like apologetics now is so different because even if people believe in the resurrection, they may not necessarily believe that that, that Christianity and its set of moral principles uh, line up with their individual autonomy. And so therefore, even if they think the historical Christian message is the truth, they're not willing to bend their personal view of it to the moral framework of it. Um, and I'm not talking just about sexual ethics. That is a part of it. I think that's the central crux of whether somebody chooses to accept or reject Christian morality. Um, but I think the uh, the views of Christian ethics and morals are so much bigger than just that. It is at the core of what this show has been for so long because it's at the core of my identity. It's the Imago Dei. Every human being is created at, in the image of God and therefore is due all dignity, all liberty, all respect. An immigrant whether they're American or not, is deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Which is, my view of the Imago Dei makes me wildly different from Republicans on immigration, but it makes me a lot closer to them on abortion, right? So, uh, you know, is Christianity a moral force for good? I think it is. I want to explore that question and learn the language, What's the history of our cultural and political history that kind of led? So, so you know, we always hear Republicans talk about the Judeo-Christian founding of the country. Well, is that true? W what values did we actually learn from Judeo-Christian values that informed the founding? Uh, weren't these guys all slaveholders, right? Uh, so exploring some of those questions. I also want to explore the problem of loneliness. I think this is the biggest problem facing us. I think people who run around wailing about like uh, the loss of democracy and the rise of white supremacist organizations and, oh my gosh, we're going, you know, I just think a lot of that is like a misdiagnosis. I've watched as libertarians have become radicalized over the last 15 years. It never has anything to do necessarily with the ideology. They do, a lot of them have a certain personal bent towards a more aggressive uh, thought structure. But by and large, it's because they feel alienated. And I am saying that, I'm saying men, him a lot, right? Because I think men especially are facing a loneliness crisis. 
Uh, and, and I want to explore that and not from a place of like men's rights and meninism and all that nonsense, but what does it mean to be a healthy masculine man in 2023? And that is wildly different than like maybe a radical feminist and what a meninist might say, right? I think those are to maybe some extremes with good points on each side. And so let's pick that apart. And what are some th ways that as this audience, which is 80% male start to thrive, we feel like we're in exile. We feel like we're alienated. We feel like we're struggling for all these things. So how can we lead? How can we start to connect with each other and start to build a movement that is built around core principles of healthy masculinity and what does that look like um and so i want to have some conversations about that and the last question that i think is really interesting that i think needs to be addressed if we're going to build a more optimistic and prosperous tomorrow is what does it mean to be human in a world of artificial intelligence and how do we um exist in a world of artificial intelligence, protect humanity, protect the Imago Dei, protect human dignity. Um, what's good and bad about all that? I use AI every single day. I use ChatGPT every single day. It makes me a better podcaster. It makes me a better broadcaster. There's a lot about it that's good, right? Um, but then there's parts of it that are bad, right? So obviously technology, I mean, we talk a lot about AI, but the cell phone, I mean, how often on this show have we talked about social media and its problems, and the cell phone, and its problems. And so I want to put a little bit more of clarifying questions to all these different strains that we have always talked about in the decade of this show, which are, what are American values? How do they play out in current events? What does it mean to be a moral person in this day and age? Um, how can we as men thrive? And what, what are the goods and bads of technology? And so I just want to clarify, though, those are the questions that we have asked for a long time on the question on, on the show, and that's what we'll be asking more of. Um, this is not an announcement that anything is changing. Like I said, you're not going to see a lot of changes. You're going to see a lot more openness, I hope, from me um, and more attention and effort placed into this show and these bigger questions. Uh, that's my goal. A lot of the inattention and lack of effort over the last two years, which has cost me a lot of downloads and a lot of Patreon support, and I totally understand. Um, it has been trying to get my feet under me as I got remarried, became a dad for the first time, moved for the first time in almost a decade, had these massive personal shifts as I had to start a business to survive. I mean, not that I... Don't make an okay salary at my job that I love, but I'm the sole breadwinner in our household because I want my wife to stay home. So I had to start a business. Um, you know, so we, we've had like a lot of big personal shifts and now we're very stable. And my wife went through five miscarriages and we had a, a very nervous, scary pregnancy. And our baby boy is so healthy and so happy and we are so blessed with him. He is an angelic creature just like his, his older sister. Um, so that kind of stress is gone. You know, issues with other people in my daughter's life, those, those stressors are gone. So I'm able to focus a lot more on this kind of stuff. And uh, I hope you'll be a part of the conversation and a part of the projects that I'm going to start. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of like a local, not a men's group, but a local book group maybe of some sort. Uh, so if you're here in Indiana or central Indiana and you'd like to be a part of that, just send me an affirmative message somehow and say, hey, if you do do this, I'd love to be on the list. And then, you know, of the five, ten people that I can support with that, then you'd, you'd be first in line. Um, but that's kind of why it's been a little half behind it. Uh, it's just been difficult, but we're in a great place right now and uh, I'm able to kind of uh, do what I love, which is this show and ask these questions and have conversations with my friends on a regular basis, as opposed to kind of like batching interviews and just scheduling them once a week. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, 
I'm not going to say it's my retirement. This is my retirement episode as a libertarian podcaster um, because I still believe that libertarianism is, by and large, the best way. But I, I just want to make a declarative statement here at the end of this episode about the future of the show and about where we've been and where we're going that I just don't care how you vote. <laughs> I really don't. I don't care if you vote libertarian or not. That's not my goal. Uh, it was for a long time and hasn't been for a long while, but I want to just uh, name it and claim it and say all the best of luck to the libertarian movement. Um, but as far as my audience goes, I can't ask my people to get involved in something that I think is uh, like... Right. So the thing about a podcast is like you talk about an issue, you talk about the problems with an issue, you stir up agitation, and then you ask people to solve the problem. Right. And what I have been lacking for a couple of years is that like, where do I drive you? Because it can't be to the Libertarian Party right now, because I can't ask you to go be abused and fight for something that I don't think has king value for the kingdom. Uh or value for your individual autonomy, right? So if you're a Christian, there's not much value there to, to, to be part of a political movement. And I think if you're a, a totally secular person, like there's not much value there either, maybe some friendship. Um, but what I want to drive you to do in asking these questions is to, to get involved in civil sector organizations, and so this is, again, tying together something that we've sort of grabbed at over the last two or three years. You know, there's three sectors of society. There's business, there's government, and there's the civil sector. And the civil sector is everything that is not mandated by force, a.k.a. the government. The core of the government is forcing you to do something. It is the monopolization of violence to get you to behave or do a certain action, behave a certain way or do a certain action. And then business, obviously, it involves capital. You need capital to make improvements. And you don't need a lot of money to go work at a food pantry. You don't need a lot of uh, money or any force to be a good dad. You know, when we're talking about the civil sector and really like recovering what we're losing, what we've eroded over the last 50 years, which is private institutions like churches, like the family, like nonprofit organizations, as they have become more central and dependent on capital and government funds uh, and business interests, um, you know, uh, social clubs. You know, it does not even a religious thing, right? Like the Lions Club is not a religious organization. And all of those organizations, the Rotary, the Lions, that that like local communities depend on to do big things like local welfare or local, you know, fairs, right? Or local food drives or whatever. All those have become totally eroded as we have become more engaged in our screens, more engaged in our own interest and individual autonomy. And so where I want to drive you is no longer to be a part of a political movement. I want to drive you to be engaged in your community and your family in a meaningful way. And uh, again, I don't think any of that is objectionable. Um, if you want to run for office, run for office, but that's f for you, right? Um, but again, my priors are that I'm a Christian and that I'm a libertarian and, uh, I don't believe in putting my hand head in the sand and saying it's all going to he heck in a hand basket. Um, I believe that things can be changed for the good. And I don't think that our future is completely screwed. I don't think our kids' generations are completely screwed. I think that societies have a fantastic ability to be elastic and that through bottom up action, we can make meaningful change that changes society in a positive way. And the, the cynicism of our generation is the thing that is stopping us. Also the cowardice, 
the cowardice to speak up about issues that are important to us because we might offend someone, the cowardice of not going through to volunteer at something, the um, self-centeredness of having wealth and not giving it to people who need it. Like, I believe in wealth distribution. I think as somebody that uh, is well off, I have personally this week been very convicted about how much money I waste on myself and how little of it I give away. And so I'm not preaching to you. I'm not telling you this is how you ought to live. I'm really like preaching to myself <laughs> in this show. And like, here is what I'm learning and here's what I'm trying to figure out and how I can be more self-sacrificial to my family, to my friends, to my community, to my employers. And uh, I just want to present to you a radical way of living that I, I'm trying to think through that I just continually to fall in love with. And uh, I hope you'll join me. And, you know, I, 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 I want to read something. This is by Faith Magazine. It's from my denomination, the PCA. Um, and they have a magazine. And this guy, Richard Doster, D-O-S-T-E-R, was writing about all the craziness um, from the, the past year, you know, from George Santos to Buffalo to New York blizzards to Ukrainians, like all the stuff he lists in the opening paragraph, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it, we don't even remember some of it. Um, so the poll quote is, it's easy to grow cynical, to feel as though there's so much wrong with the world and we can do so little. Uh, and I think that really speaks to how a lot of us feel. It, the, the issues are too big and I am too broke and I am too stretched for time. And I am too. And I think that's part of the conversation, right? But he writes, overwhelmed by such news, it's e easy to grow cynical, to feel as though there's, not, there's so much wrong with the world and so little we can do. But God's people don't get to turn away or tune it all out. Because we're called to love God our and our neighbors, we need to know what's going on, especially where we live and interact with others. We're the ones who must sift through the clutter, find what matters, and discard what doesn't. Because unless we know, we can't possibly love. And that paragraph, man, that I was like, that is what I do here. That is what I want to continue to do, is to sift through the clutter find what matters, and then identify ways that we can go out and love. So I hope you'll continue to subscribe. I hope you will join the Patreon. Uh, the, the show is fairly big, and it costs a lot of money to run the show and produce, and um, I've got freelancers I pay, and we've got shows that we run, and each one of the podcasts cost me... Um, a pretty good chunk of money a month <laughs> to run. And I don't charge them a single thing to be on the network <clears throat> because I'm a bad businessman. And also I believe in uh, what boss hog and Brian and uh, Hody and what everybody's doing. Right. So, and, and Harry at Loki wall. Um, so yeah, your Patreon contributions go to continue this mission to continue the message that I've just talked about to support my family, to support the network and so I hope that you'll continue and consider investing in what we're doing here over at Patreon. And then uh, sign up for emails over at chrisspangle.com on my Substack. Sorry, I was just coughing my head off. Uh, so if I sound a little different and strained, that's why. Um, but I really appreciate all of you. I want uh, anybody who has listened for a long time to CSS or Wall. I want you to know that I love you. I appreciate you. When I'm out in public and somebody from this audience says they listen to this podcast, I get so much more excited than any of my other shows that I do. Um, because this is my baby. This is uh, my main outlet. This is my, you know, this is my first child. And you'll always love your first child a little uh, more than the others, right? Which is weird in my case because I have like the first two two first children, weirdly. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I just want to thank you all for the support and uh, the blessing that you all have been in my life and for spreading the word. I mean, really, 
continuing to spread the word about this podcast. If you have an episode that you learn a lot on and you go, wow, this is awesome. I learned a lot about education or I learned a lot about social security is going to completely collapse. Or I thought, wow, it's okay to go to therapy or whatever, right? Please share it and uh, on your social media or text it to a friend. That is the best and really the only way that we can grow. Really any content creator, it's sharing our content. So I just want to thank you and I've rambled on enough. Uh, and thank you so much for listening to The Chris Spangle Show.